Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Likuski, uh, and I work for the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment called the FFI in Norwegian. I would like to welcome you all uh, to this seminar about the, the state of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, the seminar is organized by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime based in Oslo, Norway. And uh, with us today, uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Hassan Abbas from the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is one of the world's foremost experts on political and religious extremism in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region and has written numerous books, uh, including his most recent uh, called The Return of the Taliban, which is also the title of today's seminar. Uh, before I give the word to Hassan, uh, I would like to encourage you all uh, to think about, uh, start thinking about uh, questions to ask, uh, because there will be a Q&A session after uh, the presentation. Uh, and now I would like to give the word uh, to Hassan uh, to introduce us to today's topic, and I'm especially uh, curious to hear your uh, thoughts uh, and views of uh, the state of things in Afghanistan. Please go ahead, Hassan. Thank you so much, uh, Anne, and thank you so much to your organization for the opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm really honored and delighted and hope to have a conversation uh, in which I can share some of the thoughts I have and also learn from, from the questions and from the audience. Um, first and foremost, as a little background, um, I think it is important to see the, the, what are the sources through which we are learning about Taliban today. Uh, because for academics, for policymakers, um, that, that is um, extremely important. And um, the current state of affairs in terms of purely how we access Taliban or knowledge about them or, or learn about them, today it is far uh, easier and Taliban are far more accessible today in comparison to what was the case in the 1990s. Um, that was the time again, of course, social media has had a huge impact on in all this. In 1990s, when Taliban came uh, into power or emerged um, quite organically in some ways, and then of course, support from uh, the Pakistan side and the madrasa students. But at that time, for, for, for a significant time, we were not even aware of um, uh, the, the, the pictures of the photographs of Mullah Omar or who are his closest associates or how is he functioning? I mean, we knew um, some of the diplomats who were seeing them. The only foreign diplomats he actually uh, had a chance to meet was a Chinese ambassador. That was in 1990s. And uh, of course, the regularly the Pakistani ambassadors or Pakistani delegations. Um, so we, our information was quite restricted. Today, um, not only that we uh, have these international organizations which are visiting uh, Kabul meeting cabinet ministers. Uh, these are uh, they, there was just last week uh, conversations. In fact, uh, a couple of days um, uh, parlays uh, between United States Ambassador Tom West um, and uh, the Taliban team. In fact, uh, readouts came out from both sides. Um, so international organizations are going into Kabul meeting them. Social media, Zabin Allah Mujahid with 750,000 followers, his deputies and others with hundreds of thousands of followers. So we are consistently getting insight um, uh, in, into Taliban uh, workings. Uh, also media, of course, they, they have clamped down on media, many media channels, but there are many media channels which are still open. Tulu is one. There are many others. They are controlled, uh, but nonetheless, regularly on daily basis, we are seeing what their new projects are. <clears throat> and last but not the least, for the first time, we have access to their uh, revenue generation figures. So th there is a, a, I'll not say tons of information, but a significant amount of information which is available now in comparison to previous years. So we have a slightly better sense of where Taliban are heading, uh, what their major policy issues are. Um, uh, so it's it's less of guesswork and less of those one or two sources, uh, but they, they you can easily verify. In fact, uh, in many cases, uh, when when I was working on the book, I was able to um, get onto Twitter, um, uh, now called X, uh, but uh, reaching out to them through their DMs and they respond uh, other than the meetings as well. So that, that was just uh, first as, as a background. Secondly, in order to explain uh, the internal rivalries and dynamics, um, I think I can very briefly discuss that under four titles. Uh, first and foremost, um, is 
the and first and explain what their differences are uh, what their internal rivalries are on on what lines and then also briefly what keeps them together uh, because whether we like it or not two years after their takeover um, taliban are started giving the impression of a rather uh, uh, if not coherent uh, but at least unified government um, they, they, they there's no uh, in, in a culture where taking out gun is kind of um, a part part of the culture in in, sen- in, a, in a sense uh, or especially with those with tribal backgrounds um, it they have not um, f- started fighting uh, in, in, with weapons for example or we have not seen many hirings and firings uh, there there is this consistent expanding of the network more appointments more recruitments um, so there there is lot many things which keep them together together as well but first what keeps them and i'll try to keep um, these comments short i about take maximum 15 minutes more so first and foremost uh, the kandahar kabul um, uh, dynamic uh, and this is also quite unique unique in a sense um, we cannot compare this with almost any other country regionally except with iran to to a limited extent where the power resides with the uh, Ayatollah Faqi in in the Iranian context of the supreme leader uh, Ayatollah Khamenei and then there is elected president elected within the norms of, of the Iranian system but here we have the heartland of Taliban which is Kandahar uh, the, the hub of um, you say you would say religious world view and then it's Kabul where you have the president the two or three vice presidents um uh, 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 i'm sorry the prime minister uh, the prime minister uh three deputy prime ministers uh, the cabinet ministers now running into close to 40 or so they're shuttling across um uh, but the major power in authority now resides in kandahar at least on all the policy issues um the the, the veto power is also still with mullah hibatullah the, the supreme leader who calls himself um uh, uh amirul mu'minin which is a word which is borrowed from islamic history uh, which is a very high sounding name uh, and there there is debate uh, within the muslim circles on on whether he is using that because that was a name used historically uh, by the first four caliphs after the uh, the prophet peace be upon him and then later on uh, by some some caliphs as well kabul is where the actual day to day functioning is happening and that is quite new for uh, for uh, taliban um they inherited those cabinet ministries those uh, bureaucracies they kept some of the people from the previous uh, governments but they are hiring new people and they are trying to make those function the inter ministry the defense ministry the finance ministry the state bank and but but this in a sense not necessarily a rivalry <clears throat> but division of power happens between kandahar and kabul which is a, a distracting factor uh, because there are clear hints that those in kabul have a slightly different world view and they because they meet all the people from from outside they um, they they have to ensure that they uh, go through those bureaucratic functioning some laws some processes whereas in kandahar it is it means a fatwa or an edict the the world view of mullah hibatullah uh, and the chief justice also who resides um, in in kabul and also some of the clerics so all the clerics today small or big they are regularly moving to or shifting to kandahar i've heard that um, the, the 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 way the political scene looks like in kandahar is um, mullah hibatullah the supreme leader chief justice has a separate office and then the uh, mullah hibatullah is um, three or four main advisors uh, who it seems people are saying they are uh, people who have mostly lived in kabul before they are kind of worldly in a sense that they have some exposure and uh, then there is a small group as a small office on the side where the local mullahs or clerics come from all all across afghanistan for asking uh, for for religious guidance because hibatullah unlike mullah umar who had no uh, islamic uh, seminary degree mullah hibatullah he calls himself sheikh al hadith which means he's a um, he's an a legal expert in jurisprudence in one area and he was running a madrasa most of his life 
close to Quetta and his thinking and his knowledge and his network is all kind of those uh, uh, folks who are theologians. And he believes that uh, he, they are following, in my view, the, the Iranian model uh, uh, to, to quite an extent, because we know the Saudi model is different. Uh, they are also theologians are important, or they were at least, but they were allies of the ruling family. In many a case, this is happening in elsewhere as well. Uh, the closest model to what uh, Afghanistan today is doing is, is the Iranian model. We are also hearing that Hibatullah realized quickly that the foot soldiers were mostly in control of or operating under either Mullah Yaqub, the son of Mullah Umar, who is now the uh, defense minister, or uh, the other person, Sirajuddin Haqqani, the notorious uh, terrorist, um, who, who has a strong support base, who is Minister of Interior. He controls the border uh, posts as well. Uh, most of the revenue generation comes from there. He has about, some people say, 25 to 30,000 foot soldiers in a certain area in East. So Mullahibatullah knew that the, the, the power in many cases of control over the foot soldiers was directly happening through these two people. And that is start changing now. Changing in a sense that Mullahibatullah is coming up uh, with a new force. Um, it is rumored that that was the uh, Iranian model of IRCG. Uh, and that's what the Iranians uh, advised him. I'm not 100% sure, but I continue to hear this. Uh, but irrespective of who gave him the idea, he's building his own security force. Why is he doing that? Because of uh, uh, trying to have direct control that if what if um, they, there's a revolt, rebellion, there's uh, one of his cabinet ministers refuse. Um, although he's still highly respected, um, Tal Taliban are at the end of the day, uh, a religious movement also, and uh, a movement that succeeded through insurgency. So the command structure uh, is not loose. Um, there were various factions, but at the top, the decisions were always coming from Hibatullah. One example to reinforce this point, when negotiations were happening in Doha, uh, even though Mullah Brother was later on the lead and some of the most critical decisions were happening uh, through Mullah uh, Brother, on every critical point, I'm told by those who were participating in those meetings, on every critical point, Mullah Brother, as open minded he appeared to be, as much engaging he was, as much WhatsApp messaging he was having with um, Zalme Khalil Zad. Some people say most of the decisions took place between Zalme Khalil Zad and Mullah Brother through WhatsApp messaging. Some people are looking for that phone. I don't know whether they'll ever find it. Uh, but the point I'm making is that. Um, major decisions were all in the hands of Mullah Hibatullah uh, or Hibatullah. And uh, so now, if that was happening in the time of division, crisis, uh, uh, war, today the situation is far more better. So if there's a one big success story within Taliban in terms of power grab, it is Mullah Hibatullah. Uh, and uh, because he has been vetoing many of the decisions. So this much on the Kandahar Kabul dynamic. Uh, the only other comparable thing can be uh, Tehran Qum, but Tehran is uh, where the, the, the capital is, where the power resides, the president, the legislature in Iran, uh, but supreme leader also resides there. And Qum is where the, uh, the, the, the theological center, if you may, um, uh, exists. That's the closest you can say. In this case, also the theologians are all in Kandahar, but the supreme leader is also in, in Kandahar. This rift is going to be my view, uh, and before I move to the next point, ultimately may become disruptive uh, be because in this day and age, communications matter hugely. And uh, there is one major road and two uh, other roads that go between Kabul and Kandahar. Of course, the, you can fly and there are the airports are open as well. I think this ultimately um, can create uh, some challenges. The second thing is the religious worldview. And the religious worldview is something actually which brings all the sides together, uh, although the religious differences are there um, in terms of, for example, when the suicide bombing was uh, becoming a tool um, in Afghanistan, there were some challenges. When the, when, uh, the, the uh, normal ordinary clerics were attacked uh, during the previous uh, Republic time, there was an issue. One example there. In Pakistan, which, are much which is a much larger country, uh, where some of the internal religious divisions in the last 15, 20 years uh, became quite acute. Despite that, the number of 
progressive leaders uh, who were challenging bigotry and extremism, a uh, number of those who were killed were you go into between 15 and 20 maximum. In Afghanistan during the Republican years, eight to nine hundred hundred uh, imams of the mosques were killed by Taliban. Why? Because they were not supportive of the Taliban worldview. So the, the Taliban are very concerned about their control over the religious narrative. And by and large, it is the same. The only disruptive force there is actually ISK, uh, Islamic State of Khorasan. And that is, uh, we cannot avoid or cannot ignore this point because unlike before, when Taliban during insurgency years mostly were totally in control, their religious narrative was the, 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 the central dominant uh, narrative. Today, the Islam, ISK is having a huge impact because their transnational nature of religious worldview and extremism uh, is something that directly challenges Taliban's worldview of saying, no, we only want um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, Sharia state or emirate in, in Afghanistan. One example I'll give you, most of my conversations with uh, the, the religious elements uh, when I was working on the book and since then as well, folks were telling me that they are Taliban are really genuinely concerned the that the new debates among the young people in Afghanistan, among the Taliban uh, uh, foot soldiers or those who, who have interest in these issues, uh, which are quite a few many, are all about the nature of the state. Why? Because ISK or Daesh has come up with this new model of transnational Islamic or Islamism, uh, which is uh, influencing people's mind that they are saying, why are we restricting? And Mullah Hibbutullah is quite uh, cognizant of this fact. Uh, the two or three major speeches that he had made in Kabul, only two actually, in one case, the first speech, he intentionally said, so the Ummah is very happy. Uh, I am the leader of the Ummah. He was, and by Ummah means the Muslim global community. I think he was catering to this idea and knowing fully well that this is what Daesh is trying to say. Uh, and I have to counter that. So that also, even though most, uh, ending my second point, most Taliban have the same religious worldview, which is Hanafi, Sunni, Deobandi school uh, in many cases, in most cases, but they, the, the way they are feeling uh, defensive against the Daesh narrative of governance and jurisprudence, um, they, 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 there are these divisions and debates have opened up. This can also create more problems in times to come. The third one, and I'll close uh, uh, shortly within three to four minutes. The third one is tribalism. Um, tribalism keeps them together, uh, but also uh, now we know that Mullah Habatullah is recruiting mostly from Nurzai tribe. That is his own tribe. And uh, Mullah Habatullah, uh, the way he's different from uh, Mullah Umar and other Taliban leaders, his tribe is actually quite well known and quite powerful. Uh, so he, it's his power is not only coming from his status as as a uh, leader of the faithful, the Amir al muminin or because he's the top Taliban leader, or he controlled Shura, or he was um, he has the power to kind of veto any decision from Kabul. It is only because his tribe is relatively far more powerful. So tribal networks are extremely important as well. That's why there were some debates when the cabinet formation is happening. Uh, how many Haqqanis are there? How many their nominees are there? How many uh, of uh, those are loyalists to the main old Taliban uh, core or how many are, are the kind of uh, newer faces from, from newer tribes which are not as important. Tribalism ultimately also, uh, when there'll be more pressure, uh, the tribal identity can become more important as well. That is another uh, factor creating an issue. Last but not the least, and I think the most significant from the Western point of view, is the, um, the differences in the regional outlook. Those in Kabul want to reach out. They are engaging they realize they will only survive uh, and they will be able to, in, from their worldview, be able to convert Afghanistan into a relatively modern state or a state that it can engage and talk to other states, whether authoritarian or not. They believe they'll have to continue to, to talk. And um, the, uh, the the Kandahar group uh, is not open to that. Um, the only major uh, initiative we saw was the Prime Minister of Qatar and the royal family member from Qatar who flew into Kandahar, 
met Hibbatullah uh, and he's meeting very few people. In fact, many Afghans that I've talked to, the diaspora, uh, they're convinced that they know such person as Hibbatullah. Many people are staying, living in a, uh, in a kind of a narrative that was built by the old republic. Oh, Hibbatullah is just an extension of the Pakistani intelligence. Um, he was and in some ways uh, remained, uh, but he's also a very independent guy. Uh, he he has now his own support base. He exists. Many a people I had to had a debate debate with Afghans uh, uh, who are understandably very sad and very very worried, but they are in denial also uh, that the Taliban exists and they are talking to people. But it is the regional worldview which, which matters uh, a lot. Um, it is still the prime minister. It is still the cabinet ministers who are meeting everyone else. Hibatullah is not meeting Tom West or or the, even the Chinese minister, somebody else. Only the Qatari, because Taliban are hugely dependent on Qatar still. Uh, unlike 1990s, today UAE, Turkey, uh, and of course Pakistan, India, Iran, less so India, but Iran, these are all dominant players. Uh, Pakistanis are no more the dominant player. If you ask Pakistanis, they would mention to you immediately about, well, we are more important than Qatar and, and Doha and, and, um, and Turkey. We can deliver more, which we, which tells you there are severe uh, differences and, and rivalries. This region difference in regional outlook, which also have an impact. The old hardcore in, in Kandahar believes that more interaction with the West or with the region is going to dilute their religious political worldview. They are uh, they are scared also, I think, uh, of, of talking to the world. Where Kabul is far more confident in dealing with the world. Uh, the UAE, Turkish, Qataris are vying for getting control of uh, the, the contract for Kabul airport, other business opportunities as well. Kandahar lacks the capacity to even interact or un understand, yes, but interact or deal with these issues. And that's why they are slightly scared. And that's why they want to hold or control uh, Kabul more. And Kabul knows that, yes, they probably uh, have tremendous respect for Kandahar, and they want to stay in the system, but they know that their success depends on their um, outreach. The Uzbeks who are giving free electricity or another country which is offering Wi-Fi or internet support and others are talking to those in Kabul, not to Kandahar. So th these are the differences. And my last point is, but it is the, uh, as we say, survival of the fittest. They know that Despite these differences in which I've explained in the four, four arenas, uh, um, geographical, religious, tribal, and regional foreign policy outlook, despite that, they both sides realize, and there are more sides, but for the purpose of ease, I'm mentioning these two, um, that they know that at the end of the day, unless they are together, they have no future. Um, that's why Zabila Mujahid, the spokesperson, was told, OK, um, you are not the one who's making decisions. Uh, you are just a spokesperson. You should move to Kandahar rather than in Kabul. That was an interesting shift. So that this rivalry, this um, division, but this uh, also uh, by remaining within the unified system uh, is the new reality. And I see Taliban uh, cons consolidating power. I, I'm not seeing them weakening. Uh, a, a, as a government or as a body which is ruling, they have the control, they have the support base, uh, and their uh, financial capability is is also increasing. I think that's where I will stop, um, um, and and I'll be open to questions, and hopefully more things will come up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. That was very fascinating, and I'm looking forward to. Um, uh, discussing with you, uh, there's a lot of things. Um, well, I'm trying to decide where to start now. Um, I'd also like to remind the viewers that you're welcome to post questions in the Q&A uh, section. Um, and until we get some questions, uh, I have quite a few questions on my own. Um, basically, uh, there are two broad topics uh, I wanted to bring up with you. One was uh, about the international relations of uh, the Taliban. Uh, the other one is uh, international terrorism, uh, which is my own field of expertise, uh, of course. Uh, so uh, if we could start maybe with some uh, just questions on um, to what degree does the Taliban control Afghanistan today and what is the strength of the 
you know, are there any major opposition groups? You know, you mentioned the ISK, uh, Islamic State. Um, in my understanding, that group has become quite weakened uh, over the past years. Um, is there a major like opposition in northern Afghanistan like there was in the 90s? Um, is there an ethnically based opposition you know, from the Tajiks and Uzbeks in the north and that kind of thing? If you could start maybe talking a little bit about that, what you know from the from the field. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, I'll actually start with the topic on which you know the most, but the purpose is to learn from you also on, on terrorism and then I'll come to mm -hmm. international relations and the Taliban control and other issues on, on uh, this. This was a conversation, a fascinating conversation I recently had uh, with, with someone um, from Taliban who's aligned based um, actually uh, or, or, or quite often in Pakistan. And this is also important to explain how the Taliban the Pakistan relation has de developed because Pakistan was always seen as the hub as their backyard and Pakistan always thought that they are uh, extending their control uh, or influence in Afghanistan because they see Pakistan Afghanistan as a strategic depth. And then we realize that actually it is the Pakistani Taliban who are an extension of Afghan Taliban and they have a strategic depth in Pakistan. Now it, it is uh, the other way around. But in terms of Al Qaeda, I was asking a Taliban. Um, how should I introduce him? Um, he's an ideologue, uh, played a very important role um, in building their narrative. Um, and he's when I asked him about Al Qaeda, um, I thought he will try to immediately deny and say no, Al Qaeda is no more there. And he said it is inconceivable that uh, uh, that you can separate um, uh, the old Al Qaeda ranks uh, from Taliban. And I was surprised uh, at his openness. And he said that there have been so many um, uh, marriages of convenience. Um, they have been uh, so Al Qaeda has been kind of um, uh, assimilated. In, in many cases, he said the of course uh, since bin Laden and now Al Zawahiri and he said Al Zawahiri also was targeted because Al, Al Zawahiri had lost his old old network. So Al Qaeda was far more weakened as an organization, but their old cadres and their old folks who were part of Al Qaeda and who had worked with uh, Taliban have now had too many uh, connections, family family relationships, uh, and they are not going anywhere. And during uh, the, mm -hmm. the final negotiations in Doha, uh, whenever US uh, was pushing them about Al Qaeda, um, they never made a very clear commitment. They always said we will now not allow any terrorist organization to operate from Afghanistan, but they never made a very clear full commitment uh, on Al Qaeda. In fact, towards the end uh, of negotiations, when Taliban felt that the US was uh, had started implementing the Doha negotiations and that there was no way for the US politically under, under Trump and then Biden to, to uh, actually under, by, under Trump to back out, they started emphasizing uh, that what do you have against Al Qaeda? Even those kind of things. So Al Qaeda exists, but Al Qaeda is not as lethal as it, it used to be. Al Qaeda made some, to the best of my understanding, and you and you would know far more. And please correct me that Al Qaeda, the local Al Qaeda, if I make all that, made adjustments which were uh, religious, ideological as well. So Taliban are far more comfortable uh, within uh, Al Qaeda folks. However, there are two big challenges. One is about uh, keeping groups like Uyghur groups, um, uh, ETIM, uh, Pakistani Taliban, uh, which they are uh, still standing by. Taliban are saying we will ensure that these groups are not going to conduct terrorist activity, activity outside, but they never said that they are going to dismantle these terrorist groups uh, or extremist groups. Uh, Pakistani Taliban, for instance, because Pakistan is next door, Pakistan feels that they were the sponsors of Taliban uh, for, for quite a while and they have a right on Taliban. And the recently Pakistani army chief, Jan Asim Munir, um, uh, out of total uh, kind of, I think, uh, uh, his disgust for Taliban um, said two things. One, he called Taliban Khawarij, which is quite unusual, which is from our point of view, uh, uh, looking at this issue is quite uh, important because Khawarij is the, the oldest Islamic extremist uh, trend or within the Islamic tradition. And this was an easy way if Muslim countries had had dubbed terrorist organizations at Khawarij, it was far more easier to fight them. Uh, because within the Islamic uh, global worldview, 
uh, they, there is this kind of distaste for Khawarij and this is an anti-Khawarij feeling because Muslims see that these were the extremists who in the early days of Islam had created a big uh, fuss. And uh, so th th there's that uh, point and army chief from Pakistan and other pol pol political leaders as well, uh, they put a lot of pressure on Taliban and Taliban denied that and pushed back. And then Mullah Batullah had to give a statement saying that, uh, and this was repeated by uh, the defense minister. This was repeated just yesterday also by Sirajuddin Haqqani. They, uh, one, they criticized Pakistan by saying, you are trying to blame us for things that have gone wrong in your country. But then they also said, all Afghans, any Afghan who will go out of Afghanistan to conduct any war that is un-Islamic and that is not jihad, especially they said that it's not jihad. That, that's quite significant. Um, mm -hmm. However, they are not dismantling these groups. And this is important to understand why they are not dismantling very briefly uh, groups like TTP and others. Afghan Taliban still believe that for at any point in future, they can again come uh, in the line of fire. They can again uh, get into trouble uh, globally because of any terrorist activity that happens that is uh, then connected to Afghanistan. Um, they they still, they, they, of course, they don't like drones. They all the time, they, there's so many jokes around about drones in Kabul. Many meetings were disrupted because somebody heard a drone uh, uh, in, in the air. They, because of these factors, Taliban, Afghan Taliban know in case of a problem, again, they'll have to escape to the Pakistan-Afghanistan border region. There, their hosts are going to be in people in South Waziristan, North Waziristan, these Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban. So one, they want to honor them as loyal to them from last 15, 20 years. Secondly, they know they may need them again. So that kind of link with terrorist organization exists. And that is very, very problematic because we know for a fact from Afghanistan, Pakistan and historical context of the last 20, 30 years, Whenever you will allow these terrorist organizations to even breathe or feel a bit safe, they will think about bigger things from their point of view, which is regional and global terrorism. So that remains a major challenge. ISK, um, again, ISK, as you've rightly mentioned, has weakened, uh, but their, their ideological uh, recruitment patterns um, are there. They are, they are influential. The moment they find some space um, in any area, even a small territory. Uh, and that's entirely possible because Taliban are still trying to convert their foot soldiers uh, into an organized military force uh, or uh, police forces. Moving around with guns and Taliban and knowing is one thing. Having an organized force which is operating as an organization is still uh, something Taliban are uh, trying to adopt. In this scenario, ISK can quickly find a space or sanctuary. If that happens, then terrorism or a terrorist, transnational terrorism threat uh, can become serious. My last point on this is, I think that is the reason uh, many Western countries are engaging with them. The, the concern is humanitarian crisis also, but that is not on top of the list. The top of the list is security. And the meetings that are happening, these little collaboration that is happening, Meetings between uh, uh, Mullah Wasik, the head of the intelligence from Afghanistan, with um, uh, US intelligence chief. This was public knowledge. Um, other intel chiefs also who have met him uh, in Doha. That is only happening because of ISK fear, which is legitimate. Uh, so that that is on the terrorism issue. On the, um, sorry if I'm giving long answers. No, yeah, no, Good. go ahead, please. Uh, on the second issue, Taliban control, I already mentioned, I think it is a, a project that is taking place. But the most interesting development in my view is we have we are not seeing any um, significant opposition at this moment. All the opposition figures, uh, whether it is Dostam to Ismail Khan, uh, to, to so many others, to Abdullah Abdullah, to uh, other um, uh, uh, folks from Masood family uh, in Mazar Sharif, they're all in the region. Uh, they're either in Turkey, UAE, Qatar, or Pakistan. Pakistan also. Uh, in Pakistan, in fact, uh, one would be surprised why that is happening. But prices in in Islamabad, the, the uh, property prices have gone up because so many of the people from the old republic are there. Uh, 
Pakistan is hosting them as well because they want to keep all their uh, um, options open. Um, when I was uh, interviewing a Pakistani uh, senior official, that this is very interesting. Taliban were their historical, uh, their friends and uh, very close allies. And they said, we have learned the lesson. The last time we lost support, uh, India benefited greatly. Um, so we don't want to give India another chance. Um, what what if situation changes and these uh, lead Afghan leaders who are outside are more friendly again towards India? We will invest um, in in the um, uh, these old Republic folks as well. Most of these folks are out. Atta Muhammad Noor is in Turkey. I I, I met him and Mohakik him and Mohakik in a conference in Iraq. Very very surprisingly, uh, some time ago I've mentioned some of that in the in the book also. The point I'm making is that these regional countries are all trying to engage with Afghanistan and they have accepted Taliban as the de facto government. And whether someone likes it or not, Taliban, and whether we call that or not, Taliban are a new government. They are being recognized. They are almost recognized, uh, not under the international law diplomatically, uh, but everyone is engaging with them. Every major country in the region has an embassy there. They are not calling it embassy uh, and they have not designated their ambassadors as ambassadors because of the legal constraints. But the op if there's anyone missing in Afghanistan, that is these opposition leaders who are trying to get their act together. There are two major uh, attempts. Uh, Mr. Atma um, also is trying, uh, I think, uh, in, in a good way, trying to bring people together. Some Afghan leaders who are outside are forced to now think, should we go to Taliban and offer them that we understand you're in power? We would, Afghanistan is our country as well. We would like to contribute. We can't be your ally, but let's talk um, and we can contribute in some way as well. And some of us can come back and Taliban are uh, are have accepted this idea and there's some negotiations happening, but this will not necessarily be an opposition group. This will be a group which will go back, try to contribute, maybe try to expand. Uh, Taliban are, are, are divided on this issue and there are others then like Masood, uh, Masood San. <clears throat> uh, like from, from Mazar Sharif and elsewhere. Interestingly, I, I heard from a very credible source uh, that Masood's son, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, uh, he, Ahmed, Ahmed uh, and he and there was a meeting between him and Mullah Muttaki uh, in Iran. Uh, so Iran is trying to also bridge the gap uh, and trying to uh, all keeping aside the Iranian Afghan problem where Iran is actually trying to manipulate the water resources and problems and Taliban came close to a planning for war and all that we, we heard that but then both sides realized they cannot afford a war at this time mm -hmm. um, and and so, but Iran is trying to be a bridge builder also between the opposition forces in Afghanistan so I clearly see Taliban or only strength getting strengthened uh, and and for the ordinary Afghans they uh, they are in a terrible position. They uh, I'll give an example from recent years, which you I'm sure your audience will remember. Also, uh, during the last days of the Ashraf Ghani government, there was this uh, one uh, truce that was announced for Eid, and we remember those day, couple of days when uh, ordinary Afghans uh, and Taliban came out and met and hugged people, and the local security forces were also talking to Taliban. Everyone was pleasantly surprised. In fact, that was a major uh, point where Taliban were convinced uh, that negotiations should carry on. Afghan government was, was really worried. They refused to extend that truce because they realized that Taliban are our enemy. Uh, if, if the people Taliban connection is getting strengthened, this is bad for Kabul, which ultimately happened. The point again I'm making is ordinary people have no other options. They don't like what Taliban are doing about the girls education. Uh, minorities are getting squeezed further. We get a chance. We'll talk about that. The Taliban started off as relatively open minded towards minorities. With every month, there is some law here or there that they are pushing back, trying to restrict uh, the minorities, whether Muslim minorities or non Muslim minorities, um, the Shias, the Sufis. Uh, so there's that important factor at play as well. It is not the Taliban of 1990s. Uh, they are allowing some of the Sufi groups to operate. I must add uh, there is in my book, there's a picture of this famous shrine in Kabul, which where Taliban used to attack that shrine. Now armed guards from Taliban are securing that place. 
because Daesh is the new bad boy. Daesh is attacking Sufis. Daesh, Daesh is attacking Shia Muslims. So Taliban are trying to support them and defend them. Uh, to which, I mean, if, if uh, Taliban deserves some credit that they have opened uh, their minds in, in certain ways, but not as much to the opposition. And that's that's what is surprising. The ordinary people are feeling neither there's opposition forces here nor Western forces. And uh, the economy has changed drastically. So they are scared uh, and they, the humanitarian crisis is so severe, which is having demographic changes. So the ordinary people believe there's no point fighting Taliban because there is no support from any side. So they are, are, uh, are kind of partly crushed and partly trying to think, OK, how will we operate within this system? That that's the reality of Afghanistan today in terms of the opposition forces. I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, wow, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I got a question here, uh, and I think you've already mentioned it uh, in your previous answer. Um, but we have this perception in, in the West that the Taliban is doing a lot of bad things to their population, like human rights violations, especially towards women. Um, shrinking the the rights of women that they had enjoyed during the former re regime regime. Um, so, did I hear you correctly that you're saying that Taliban? You think they actually have a lot of support in the current population in Afghanistan? Uh, and the question actually is about if the Taliban isn't delivering services to the people, how sustainable are they as a government in in the long run? Extremely important question. I, I don't think Taliban are popular in the sense if, if there's, for instance, elections today, I still doubt uh, if people uh, will vote Taliban in government. Um, Taliban support, I think even um, if we are from, from, from Taliban perspective, I think in their hearts they know it may be 30%, 40% maximum. Um, 30 percent is my guess, uh, because what I'm saying is the ordinary people have uh, been forced to accept them. Uh, so they, they they are tired of war and they're also extremely disappointed in the government that was thrown out. Uh, um, people are legitimately uh, asking and even if not asking, I think this is a fact um, that all those who are living in Turkey and Doha and Pakistan and elsewhere um, uh, all, all from where all the money is coming in. Um, all the corruption money, the, the corruption and incompetence were the reasons with that Ashraf Ghani had to uh, flee. Um, there, there's no doubt there. Of course, many people who are honest, I, I know people who had worked in Afghan government who are very, very sad, who are very, very disappointed. Um, they had left their homes in West to go back and help Afghanistan. There is a new reality of Afghanistan. I, we, we cannot deny their sacrifice, their hard work, but, the, but that many of the top leaders made tons of money also and their corruption is what had disgusted the ordinary people so it's not that people have changed their worldview those especially in urban areas um, still uh, um, are very very uh, um, concerned skeptical about taliban but taliban have also made adjustments in their attitude yes there are some revenge killings but that was initially a clear messaging that we anyone who will agree to stay and cooperate uh, or will not challenge us, we will not go after them just because they were uh, anti-Taliban. Um, some of the notorious, well-known uh, soldiers and uh, commanders were targeted. Many of them had already left, of course. Uh, but Taliban, I'll not say are gaining in popularity, but they are getting more acceptance um, because there is lack of options. What is the option an ordinary Afghan has? So in that sense, they are being accepted, but not necessarily liked. Um, hmm. that, yeah, that, that, and Taliban, so, so sustainable, they're sustainable because for quite some time, one, because there's no clear uh, strong threat to them uh, at this time, neither from internal uh, political groups, uh, nor from those who, have, uh, who, who are outside, um, even in the, as we know, Taliban were able to gain access and, and support and they took over areas in the north. Everyone was surprised. We thought east will be the uh, south will be the area where Taliban were strong. And from that side, they will walk into uh, Kabul. Uh, but surprisingly, they had cut deals with so many groups uh, uh, in, in the north also. And there apparently what I'm hearing are Khalil Haqqani, the architect of many of those deals, the uncle of uh, Siraj Haqqani. 
uh, he's now head of the, uh, the re leading the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Uh, those deals, the tribal deals that they had done uh, are still intact. Uh, yes, even if nominal, but the army chief um, of, of Taliban is uh, not a Pashtun. Uh, uh, also, some other Uzbeks and Tajiks are there. Two Hazara cabinet members are there. So the, the way West expects them to be inclusive, which, which frankly and honestly, I'm a bit surprised at that demand. Um, it's not a democratic government uh, and it's uh, Taliban are not open to this. We had the great opportunity uh, to build an inclusive Afghanistan uh, and that although we built Afghanistan, I think those institutions were impo important. Uh, there's a new middle class, uh, but when somebody is in total control, uh, how can you expect them to be inclusive? Uh, can we go to Qatar, UAE and Saudi Arabia and tell their monarchies, uh, please be a bit inclusive, including your opposition leaders? We would never do that. Or maybe if we'll do, we'll do it very close in friendly way when you're talking between two leaders and uh, not publicly openly. So, so, so Taliban, uh, I think, are in a strong position. They're not going anywhere in five to seven years. That That's my projection, unless there is some terrorist act uh, or some internal factions or a, or an assassination that happens, which is you cannot rule that out um, uh, internally uh, because the clear signal is uh, all they, there have been no shifts and no firing of any top leader. There was one point when Siraj mm -hmm. Haqqani made some commit, uh, made some statements which were very critical of Hibbutullah mm -hmm. and he was called in uh, along with uh, Mullah Yaqub. Um, I heard they were kept waiting in in Kandahar for a whole day and then they were given audience uh, for a short time and then at that time they were given a piece, uh, Ibutullah gave, gave them a piece of his mind um, and since then we have not heard those kind of statements. In fact, mm -hmm. yesterday uh, Siraj Haqqani exactly repeated what was the message coming from uh, 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 from Kandahar. It is a very important sign. Siraj Haqqani is seen as closest to Pakistan. He is he has excellent relations with Pakistan. He is Pakistan's main support base within Afghanistan today. And yesterday he was very critical of Pakistan. Uh, and he said Pakistan is trying to blame us for things they cannot control internally. And he also said that the negotiations with Tehreek-e Taliban and Pakistan failed because of internal political challenges in Pakistan. Why is Siraj Haqqani saying this? He's saying this because he realizes he being seen as very close to Pakistan is not good for him politically within Afghanistan, which means he's seeing the Afghan system stabilizing to an extent that uh, he's better off by trying to expand his roots and networks within Afghanistan rather than depending on some of his friendships and support from Pakistan. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, uh, you already um, talked a little bit about um, diplomacy and Taliban. And, and of course, uh, here in Europe and in the US, uh, the discussion is about how to engage with the Taliban. Should we keep condemning them? Should we talk? Uh, and I think um, you already said a little bit about it. Uh, but what would be your main advice to Western governments uh, based on how you know uh, Taliban from the inside? What What's the best way of engaging uh, with the Taliban? Thank you so much for this question. I'm convinced and I know that when I had first said it, it was not a very popular idea. Still, uh, I have very few takers in Washington, D.C. because of the political dynamics. President Biden and the, this current administration want to stay as much as far away from Taliban was seen as engaging with Taliban as possible because um, it, it has political connotations. Um, they, mm -hmm. The current administration can be blamed for a withdrawal, which is seen by experts as a totally messed up activity. And also, although Trump was the one who had signed up the Doha deal, he's the one who had opted for conversations and dialogue and parleys with Taliban. But um, at the end, it was the Biden administration uh, which had to implement the, the final stage of withdrawal. So they, they want to stay away from it. They don't want to be seen as doing any taking any major initiative. The also worry is what if there is uh, some bad thing that happens and that is linked to Taliban that can be devastating politically. Elections are in, in 18 months and with the political polarization 
um, in US and elsewhere, these things, um, foreign policy is never a defining factor in American politics in presidential elections, but you never know if something goes wrong, um, which is blamed on, on, uh, on, on the government and administration, this can be a problem. That's why probably there are not many people are talking about it, but I am very convinced that talking and en engaging with Taliban um, is a sane policy. Um, and I have been advocating that, yes, women rights are extremely important. Uh, we need to keep the pressure on Afghanistan. Uh, we know Taliban's worldview and especially Kandahar's worldview, which is uh, they're, they're these layers of bigotry and extremism. Uh, we cannot defend or justify that under any circumstances. Having said that, uh, we, we tried our level best. I mean, we, we, our Western capitals should not forget um, there was the opportunity billions, tens of billions and from US side a trillion dollar or more than that was invested. We uh, the local dynamics are different. Taliban are back in the government. It happened because there were conversations and a, and a dialogue and, and the Doha deal. Uh, more effort, in my view, should be spent on either refining, expanding, developing, if amending need be the Doha deal, but continue mm -hmm. to engage with them. One, there is a humanitarian angle. We cannot uh, allow the ordinary Afghan people to be crushed. It is keeping in view the interests of the ordinary Afghans uh, who, who we, we, we owe something to them. Um, Afghanistan had been in the middle of wars uh, from the old British versus Russia wars to the Afghan jihad of the 1980s to then the Taliban and then the government. Um, I think the, the biggest victims have been the ordinary Afghans and keeping their interest in view. Engagement, I'm not saying recognition, uh, but recognition may not be very far away if Taliban are living up to uh, some of the promises. Um, if you read the 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 Tom West um, re readout, surprisingly, there is a kind of a uh, attempt to at the end to say there are possibilities of even ec economic engagement and and mm -hmm. a collaboration and cooperation on other issues. I think that is this my uh, my personal understanding and my uh, kind of uh, personal assessment. No, no direct information is that more engagement is going to empower the more pragmatic elements in Kabul. Uh, because that is we know the debate in Afghanistan is between Kandahar and Kabul about the outreach. If we if there is more outreach and more engagement from the West and even from the region, that is going to automatically support the pragmatic elements. Those pragmatic elements within Taliban are our best bet. It's not, I don't want to, if the Taliban are hearing, I'm not trying to say, okay, these pragmatic elements are going to kill and overthrow uh, Kandahar. They probably mm -hmm. continue to exist uh, as they are, uh, but those pragmatic elements, we want them to succeed. Um, one, because that is the only way their more engagement means uh, more cooperation more cooperation means you have more leverage also. And there are more chances that Afghan economy and ordinary Afghans will be looped into the regional economy at, uh, also. Um, they are raising funds. They are uh, generating revenues. They are sharing those figures as well. This is all very unprecedented, uh, unprecedented developments from, from the Taliban uh, worldview. And this shows they want to engage. If you will isolate Afghanistan, you are also ensuring that it will again become a hub of extremism. So okay. that's why engagement, uh, I think, is the only way forward. It should be carrot and sticks in a sense, um, um, whether there are sanctions or whether there are other factors. There are some on the list of terrorism um, uh, kind of from, from UN sanctions body. Uh, they're on the terrorism list. Uh, we should continue to push for in every meeting about education. I've heard Taliban are making a case that they will open up schools after curriculum changes. Um, and that will be a good point to see what kind of curriculum changes are happening. Again, we cannot enforce that. And I would like to remind uh, whether we ever had a chance to, uh, there were many countries uh, which engaged with and had excellent relationship with the West, uh, where the local realities were absolutely pathetic when it comes to minority issues. Uh, whether it comes to women, country X, you can't even drive a car, now it has changed. In other places, the religious bigotry uh, was uh, something that was sponsored and supported. 
how many a times we we push them like we are pushing taliban today i'm mm-hmm. not trying to say taliban are um, uh, kind of a force uh, of uh, positive change etc N- not at all but these engagements we we have to be fair and give taliban a chance that's and i know this will immediately make some people cringe and say uh, whether i could I, am i saying on al qaeda and because these names were taken together so many a times um, but taliban are different they have taken over uh, pragmatic elements deserve a chance deserve a chance why because that is our only uh, i would say reasonable hope that the bigotry of kandahar will be pushed back and there are some extremists in kabul also i'll give one example mm-hmm. um i had a chance to talk to some friends in madrasa hakania and this is the one person who um, government officials in pakistan also told me um, sakib uh, his, his name is a cabinet minister leading uh, to religious and hajj affairs he is a notorious bigot he is the one who created a uh, huge sectarian issues within pakistan also he was someone who the religious seminaries actually were pushing out and trying to dissociate with he is such an extremist he is a cabinet minister in kabul actually spending most of the time with mulla uh, hibatullah in kandahar he is one of his close associates so there are many elements which which are real bad news i'm not saying taliban they're more pragmatic elements are strong they are really um, uh, very very uh, uh, extremist elements in taliban but what is our option bomb afghanistan again um, we we cannot um, our hope is that doha deal somehow will be reinvented in a way that will ensure security security comes first um, then the humanitarian issues and th- for for that to push continuous engagement that's the only way we continue to know what's happening on the ground hmm azan um thank you so much for your um somewhat provocative but um i have to say i agree with a lot uh, also with what you're saying um seems to me um we're at a crossroads today you know with uh, um, in terms of how to engage with the taliban that resembles a bit like uh, the 90s you know where taliban as we know were pushed were isolated and pushed into more extreme direction um um we have to wrap up this meeting now because we only have a, a one or two minutes left um so i'd, I'd like to thank uh, all of you um that have been following us thank you for all the questions um and we could have uh, been going on <laughs> with the discussion so much longer but we have to uh, wrap up now uh, and last but not least uh, thank you so much hasan for joining us and for taking the time uh, to share your insights with us thank, thank you so you much so kind of you thank you thank you